Welcome to Mind and Heart. I'm Sister John Dominic, a foundress of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. It has been my joy to have been involved in Catholic education for over 30 years. One of my privileges for the community has been to create Lumen Ecclesiae Press, a publishing organization that develops educational resources used now by over 500 schools around the United States and the world. Lumen Ecclesiae is our call to magnanimity, our call to be large soul, to do something greater for the church. So today, I invite anyone interested in becoming a saint to join with us as we unpack the deep beauty, mystery, and certainties of our faith to transform our lives so that we can know, love, and serve God with our mind and heart. Welcome to Mind and Heart. And on this episode, I'm very happy to have with me a Dominican friar, as you can see, Father Gregory Pine. And Father, I'd like to welcome you. And if you could, for those people that are listening and viewing, if you could just give an introduction about yourself and so that we can get to know you. Sure. Be delighted to. Uh, let's see. I was born uh, outside of Philadelphia, um, raised in a Catholic family, and my older sisters went to Franciscan University of Steubenville, so I quite naturally followed uh, their indication. And um, when I went to Steubenville, I, let's see, during my freshman year, I heard a lecture given by a professor uh, visiting from St. Louis University, a professor named Eleanor Stump, and she spoke about Aquinas on the nature of love. And for whatever reason, I just found it especially beautiful and especially compelling. And it was as if she were kind of putting into words or giving expression to things that I myself had kind of sensed or hoped to be able to enunciate, but never really said clearly. Um, and I just found it here present. And so I, I you know, kind of was led, led naturally to ask, like, who is this St. Thomas Aquinas fellow? And started reading about him. And then I, uh, I read a book called The Quiet Light by Louis DeWall. Yeah. So like one of these historical fiction, super charming. And I just, I was especially taken with the way that St. Thomas loved the Lord. And so I wanted to love the Lord in the same fashion, came to discover he was a Dominican friar. And so I entered the Order of Preachers in 2010, uh, the province of St. Joseph, so like the, the Eastern province. And then I was ordained a priest in 2016. And um, since that time, I've been assigned just to do studies, to work at a parish that we have in Louisville, Kentucky, and to teach there at a university, Bellarmine University. And then for the past year or so, I've been assigned to Washington, D.C., to our House of Studies, where I work for the Thomistic Institute. So you found your vocation at a, at a Franciscan university, I so that do. was good. You know? <laughs> now, had you had any exposure to Dominicans before that? I, If I had, I don't remember. Okay. Um, yeah, so at the age of 19, having read that book, I began very confidently to tell people that I was called to be a Dominican priest. But I had not yet met a Dominican priest. Yeah, so so right, right. So your gateway into the order was through uh, Saint Thomas, and I think that that's pretty. Um, it's amazing because really, what you're doing now is making his teachings. It's a little bit. It's kind of like the same thing we're doing on the virtue side with the disciple of Christ education and virtue, where we're taking, you know, uh, Saint Thomas's teachings on the virtues and trying to make that accessible. To Catholic school teachers and uh, and to students, I think the work that you all are doing, which is fantastic at the Domestic Institute, which I'm going to want you to explain about, is really helping us get this great body of teaching more accessible. So, why don't you? How did it start, the Domestic Institute, and uh, where did it start, and where is it today? Sure. So, it started about 11 years ago. Uh, Father Thomas Joseph White had the idea that. It could begin as a research institute, effectively, of our faculty at the House of Studies. Um, the thought being that the Thomistic tradition is perennial, it's wise, it continues to recur throughout the life of the church um, because it's excellent for teaching, it's excellent for training priests, it's excellent for thinking well about the mysteries of the faith. Um, and so he just had the sense like, we have a good thing here, um, but because of the monastic character of our life, we don't necessarily get the word out as well as one might. So if we were to found this research institute, uh, it'd be a good way by which to organize conferences and get the conversation started. So 11 years ago, he started hosting conferences at the House of Studies and then started having conferences at different locations. So one at like Princeton Theological Seminary about the thought of Karl Barth in St. Thomas Aquinas, one in the Hudson River Valley, like a summer philosophy conference or seminar. 
um, and then a conference for priests. And it just kind of gradually picked up a little bit of steam. And then we started doing um, events in New York City. And then it was about four years ago uh, when Father Dominic Legg uh, came on as the assistant director. Uh, they had the idea to start a campus chapters program. And again, the idea was like, we have all of these riches of the Thomistic tradition, an embarrassment of riches. Uh, who are we, in a certain sense, to hoard them? Uh, and so they also had a kind of urgency about uh, kind of getting the word out to the university culture, the campus okay. culture, because uh, St. Thomas, you know, he's the patron saint of Catholic schools, patron saint of education. Uh, but also he's proposed as a good model for like the integration of the sciences. Right. Because I think a lot of times folks go to a university and they study their particular thing, whether it be, you know, anthropology or biology or whatever. Uh, and they just kind of operate within that vein. Um, and then even if there is a little bit of a core curriculum, it's not usually especially wise or well construed. And so you learn a lot about one thing, but the big questions of life, like who is God and what am I, are left somewhat unaddressed. So uh, St. Thomas is often proposed as a great way to gain access to uh, an articulated tradition, um, to a, a theological culture that gives order to the other disciplines and helps you to, to study well, uh, to learn well, to love well. And so they began at four universities um, that first year, ones where we already had a presence in campus ministry. And then since then, it's grown. We've gone to about 10 to 12 new campuses each year. So um, we're at maybe like 50 campuses now in the United States, in Canada, in England, and in Ireland. And then just this past fall, Father Thomas Joseph was assigned by the Master of the Order to start a Thomistic Institute in Rome, which has the same kind of charge, I suppose, or commission for continental Europe. So he's begun chapters in, they're having success in Portugal and in Spain and throughout. So, yeah. So do things. you find uh, Dominicans in those different areas that, that become a part of the the chapter or, or, or how are you invited to like a university? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So not, we don't necessarily have a Dominican, a consistent okay. Dominican presence okay. on these campuses. It's the students themselves who are actually the protagonist of the yeah. work. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> one of the things that's great about the Thomistic Institute is that it's pretty lean, uh, which is to say there's not a lot of overhead because the students uh, get motivated about whatever it is within the Catholic philosophical or theological tradition. They want to know, they reach out to the Thomistic Institute. They say, can we start a chapter? We say, find some friends who have, who are like-minded and want to do the work as well, and then get recognition by your campus. Uh, and then you have, you know, the access to the academic buildings or rooms where you need to host events, and then you can just start hosting events. So, you know, you want to check in with the chaplain to make sure that everything's all square, but the Thomistic Institute isn't doing ministerial work in the strict sense, you know, that we don't have care of souls. So it's it's a it's an intellectual apostolate. Right. It's a way to right. affect the intellectual evangelization of your campus. And so the students themselves are super motivated about it. They're asking the questions. They're inviting the speakers to provide the answers or to help them ask yet better questions. And then they're the ones that are inviting their friends that are getting them, you know, involved in the work and helping, you know, to get the word out. And so then all of these lectures are recorded. We put them on a podcast. People listen. They're like, I want this on my campus. And then the invitations continue to come. So it's awesome. Well, there really is. I mean, that's just, that's that's a real organic growth, you know. So let me ask you this. When you all were, think, were thinking about this, was this kind of one of these things that happened like at recreation or in the... <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's where our great ideas come to, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think all Dominican great ideas usually happen at recreation <laughs> or in the chapel. Uh, yeah. For the office of readings before, right. <laughs> so during the second reading, we often leave like a good minute or two yeah. after the reading and before the responsory. For me, that's when everything comes all together. The, all the good <laughs> ideas come right, exactly. And it's usually when you can't do anything about it, so you got to hold on to it that's right. for the rest of the time. Or you scandalously write it down yeah. in the presence of the brethren. Um, so it was Father Dominic and Father Thomas Joseph were meeting with a friend in town, and they're like, what are we going to talk about? Uh, what, what notions or what ideas will we pose to him? And Father Dominic had had experience in college, uh, well, as a law student. Uh, he had had experience with the Federalist Society, which okay. does a similar thing at law schools. Uh, so it organizes lectures. The students themselves organize a chapter, and they're the ones that proffer the invitations, host the conferences, whatever it else. And um, he said, what if we were to do something on the model of what the Federalist Society does, yeah. but to do it with the Catholic intellectual tradition rather than, you know, law, public policy, et cetera? And Father Thomas Joseph was like, that's a good idea. Yeah. Let's see how it Let's goes. Go. <laughs> and then it's just the rest is history. The rest Gosh, is history. That's fascinating. Okay, so then have you recently there's been this so wait, how many people are, have subscribed then to the 
what you have online, the Domestic Institute, how many, I guess, followers or sure, yeah. students or that you, that you know of? Yeah. Uh, short answer you know, is I have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I you're should be better. You're just doing the work. You're preparing the yeah, content exactly. and they're, you know. Uh, yeah, you keep your uh, whatever it is to the yeah, plow. Um, right. So I don't know exactly. I know that um, we have, I can tell you, like events that we have. So over the course of the year, we host between 12 and 15 conferences. Uh, and then another few retreats and then on campus events usually number between. So each year it numbers last year it numbered about 250. This year it'll number about 300 on campus events. Okay. So that's, that's, that's about good. on average about that's five good. events per campus and then mm -hmm. the conferences themselves. And the average attendance at each event is somewhere around 60 to 65. So 300 times 60, you have like 18,000 people are in the seats. And then um, when it comes to the podcast last year, we had, 750,000 listens. Wow. Uh, and that number grows exponentially. So, you know, it was that that was a million listens when you added in the uh, like 250,000 from yes. the three years previous. Yeah. So it's just, it grows and grows. And certainly as the content comes out. So each, you know, you put up a lecture and within the first couple of months, maybe 5,000 people will listen to it, which is super encouraging because it gives that content a much longer half-life right. rather than just being extinguished with yeah. the final syllable. Well, it's just so exciting to think that this that you all are making this accessible. I mean, like, you know, this is kind of what we're doing here. We see this as the new, you know, the new public square for Dominicans, sure. you know, that we can find a way to, to reach people. And uh, so if you, if you take, you know, cause sometimes, you know, people can get a little intimidated by St. Thomas and they're thinking, oh, there's, there's no way I'm going to, you know, be able to understand this, but what have you are doing now? You've got the Aquinas 101. So what kind of led to, maybe dialing it back a little bit to sure. give, uh, so what, what was the thought behind that or how did that come come about? I think the general conviction was that we as human beings have minds with which to know and hearts with which to love. And that's what sets us apart from the beasts. That's what constitutes us as made to the image and likeness of God. And so our perfection is really bound up with knowing well and loving well. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then study even if it's not like an intellectual life in the kind of hoity-toity sense, but right. study is an integral part of human flourishing. And I think that's really near and dear to the Dominican charism because a lot of people, they kind of say the things that I've tried to study, uh, you know, in the faith are really confusing, difficult, don't really do much for me. So I'll just give myself a free pass yeah. and I'll content myself with something else. Right. But, but I won't really try to work in the Christian intellectual tradition because it's all, it's all too much. Uh, but we, we had the experience on campuses where these students were very much inclined to what was being proposed, but they also had a desire to go about it systematically. They had a desire to start at A and end with Z. Mm -hmm. So that way they could read these thinkers on their own terms rather than just being, I don't know, um, tossed about by time and fate and, and subject to whatever content they could find available, but in an unsystematic way. Right. You know, because a lot of, you can get yourself an eclectic formation in whatever you want, uh, but a lot of times when you're having conversations, you realize that there are gaps in your knowledge and you wish you had the tools to address those gaps, but you don't know how to go about it. So the students themselves, I mean, the idea for Aquinas 101 was, was given by the students or it was formulated by the students. And then it also corresponded to a brainstorming session that we had had at recreation <laughs> uh, where we were like, we should, you know, gloss the whole SUMA in videos and call it simply <laughs> SUMA. Uh, we, we kicked that uh, name to the curb because it was like, you know, insider talk. But um, <clears throat> so the students were like, we want to give this to our friends. We ourselves want to learn it, but we want it in an idiom that makes sense. Because when you start reading St. Thomas, you're like, vocabulary, yikes, grammar, right. wowzers, uh, literary genre, Ooh, you know, yeah. so all, it can be a bit, <clears throat> but if you put in an initial effort, you come to discover that it's actually, it's doable. Uh, and then reading everyone else becomes hard because you're like, wow, this is just such a heady wine. Woo. Uh -huh. um, so just as in order, in order to read any great thinker, you often need a translator, right. you know, you often need like, I mean, a literal translator. Like you think about reading Dostoevsky's novels, uh, you need them from Russian to English. But with St. Thomas, it's not just from Latin to English. It's also from the 13th century to the 21st century. Right. And so we thought that Aquinas 101, which is this course of videos, right? So 85 to 90 videos when it's all done, each of which is accompanied with a podcast for extended meditation and then some reading so that you can get into St. Thomas on your own terms. Okay. We thought that this would be a great way by which to do it just because... Yeah, while a lot of people are listening to podcasts, the kind of attention that you devote to a podcast isn't always 
the, the best attention. Uh, but when you're sitting in front of the computer and you're watching a video uh, and it appeals to you at every sensory level, that oftentimes that's a great way to begin. So yeah, we started talking about it about a year ago and getting the gears moving. And then we started releasing the videos uh, at the end of August. And then from that point on, we've been releasing two a week and people seem to like it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it is. Well, it's just, it, it, they are very engaging. I mean, the, I mean, it was genius to have to come up with the, I mean, they're like, they're not more than five minutes long. So yep. it's just enough to hold your attention to kind of bring you into it. Yeah. And what's nice is I found is that if you feel a little bit intimidated, you know, like, how am I ever going to, like, you, especially how you broke down how to read the Summa, you know, it's like, okay, this is the, like, and it's the same way every time, yeah. you know, and that's, that was just very helpful in translating, you know, you take the Latin term and then you kind of say, well, this is what it means. So, so who, are you all writing these scripts together or who's doing, all, who's the brains behind all this? Is it you? And uh, So Father Dominic is the director yeah, of the Thomistic yeah. Institute. And there are five presenters. So Father Dominic, Father James Brent, who teaches philosophy at the House of Studies, Father mm -hmm. Thomas Petrie, who's the dean and vice president, and who teaches moral theology, um, myself, and then Father Thomas Joseph White, who runs the Thomistic Institute at the Angelicum in Rome. And so each each friar formulates his own scripts, and then we kind of we'll, we'll vet them in post production okay. to kind of get them down to size, so that way they're nice and crisp. Uh, they give you what you need to know, and um, you know, help you kind of take you by the hand and walk you into the essentials, but don't necessarily overwhelm you with too terribly many details. Uh, so yeah, it's a joint venture. I'd, so where are you, where are you going? You've got this now. How many years do you have? You said you what's the, what's the full thing? You've got the first year, and then so the full yeah. course will run till the end of basically we'll continue to release videos until the end of June. Okay, and then we're beginning conversations as to what Aquinas two hundred one looks okay. like. Okay, right. So <laughs> I suspect that the things that will continue to come out will be application. So a lot of people in the 21st century have particular questions when it comes to how Thomistic philosophy or, or Thomistic theology accords with what we have learned from like the scientific disciplines, for instance. Right. So you might anticipate something along those lines. So like Thomistic natural philosophy and the physical sciences, how do those, how do these things come together and how does philosophy help us think well about science in a way that's not materialistic or reductionistic or otherwise captive to a philosophy that might just be false, you know? Because a lot of times you walk into a you walk into a science class and you're just like, okay, this is my teacher. He or she has the answers and I will submit my mind. And when it comes to science, oftentimes that's a that's a fair arrangement. But when that teacher smuggles in some philosophy and doesn't acknowledge it to you, you can be like, yes, you're right. The only thing in the world is matter. Like, yes, you're right. There are no such mm -hmm. things as formal and final causes. Yeah, you're right. I don't need God in this universe. Um, and then you find yourself laboring under the weight of false notions. Whereas if you can kind of address those philosophical questions right. at the outset, you do well. And then one, one thing was real clear in the one, what I, what I love is that you, how you bring together faith and reason. Yeah. And uh, you've got the one with the, with the tree and you kind of go through each one, but then the showing the, the supernatural and just understanding, but the, but the, what was so great about, it, I can't remember which one that was in, but, uh, where the roots are going and showing the connection yeah, yeah, yeah. because that's so important in our day that, that there is no contradiction between faith and reason. Right. Um, and yeah. to bring that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love, I love as St. John Paul II talks at the beginning of Fetus at Ratio that they're the two wings yeah. whereby we mount to the knowledge of the truth or the knowledge of God. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. And, and when people hear that, they find it very liberating. Because I think a lot of times folks think that you have to shut off part of your humanity in order to be faithful to the scientific community or in order to right. be faithful to right. your worshiping community. But truth be told, truth, well, truth be told, uh, <laughs> truth is one, right? And if these yeah. are legitimate ways to access the truth, then um, we're going to find them to be symphonic. Right. They won't be in, in genuine conflict. Either we've misunderstood the science or we've misunderstood the theology. But they're not in real conflict because what we're describing is reality. Right. And it's about conforming our minds to reality. Yeah. Father Dominic has a great video about that where it shows somebody looking through different windows, right? Uh -huh. And you shut up, you kind of shutter one and then shutter the other. And then what you actually have access to is the thing. So it's not so much about closing off part of your mind or closing off another part of your mind. It's about, yeah, gazing upon what is with authenticity. And then so important too, I mean, just again, is that unity, you know, because we don't want this dualism, you know, to, to, to separate. Hmm. You know, the body and soul, but we bring that together. Of course, we would know that would be something Thomas taught against. You know? Right. 
Well, Father, uh, this is so, I mean, just thank you all so much that you're able to make this. You know, it's so, it's so interesting. Our uh, One of our sisters who's teaching uh, junior high, she's showing them the videos and then having them do a workshop as they're watching it. So she's taking the, the junior high kids through Aquinas 101, and they're getting it. That's awesome. I mean, you know, she's just breaking it down so that they're watching it. So. I encourage anyone, you know, if you're if you're listening, if you can, why don't you tell people where they can find this? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's Aquinas101.com. Yeah. And if you visit the website, you'll see a feature to enroll. And that simply means that you'll get emails every Tuesday and Thursday with uh, the videos as they come out. And it'll pace the course for you so that way it's not overwhelming. But you'll find all the content there on Aquinas101.com. And you can, you know, search the videos. They're all on YouTube. Um, but we have it such that when you get a video, you also get it with... Um, yeah, you get it with a uh, course listening and then a course reading, and then there's always a Ask a Friar feature. So if you have a question that, that comes up and you want to ask a friar, you just click the button, send an email. I'm the friar. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so you get an email now, back from me. Now you have a face to it right here. <laughs> uh, it might take me a week. It's been taking me about a week in a lot of cases. So so I ask your patience. I just say, how many do you get? I mean, the more this grows, I mean, you're, you're going to have to get a, t- a team of people to help you with that. I may. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I may. We'll see. Uh-huh. <laughs> A quantity, I'll say. Exactly. I, I get a quantity of emails. All right, so that's Aquinas 101. And then what happens if there's a like someone who's listening from a university or something that's looking to bring the Thomistic Institute? How does that how does that happen? Sure, yeah, you just visit. Are you the email person for that too? No. <laughs> I'm not. There's someone else for that. Uh, it's ThomisticInstitute.org. And if you know, you'll like just kind of look, and it's pretty intuitive. You just click and send us an email and express your interest, and then we'll work with you to see if it's feasible for this year, and if not, maybe for next. And uh, we'll go from there. So, yeah. Oh, good. Well, thank you, Father. Uh, once again, our guest is uh, Father Gregory Pine, a Dominican from the St. Joseph's Province, and the wonderful work that he's doing with the Thomistic Institute and Aquinas 101. And thank you, Father. We certainly would love to have you back the next time you, you come through uh, Michigan to see us. Okay. Thanks so much, thank Sister. If you like this episode of the Mind and Heart Podcast, I invite you to click on the next available podcast and continue to enrich your mind, heart, and soul.